The men said to one another, Let us cast lots and find out on whose account this misfortune has come upon us. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So the sailors, desperate to get out of this situation, decide to use an ancient form of divination, the casting of lots. The idea was that this device of random choice was a way for the gods to communicate with humanity. The gods would affect the casting of the lots and let you know what you wanted to know. Before you dismiss this as just some pagan tomfoolery, we see Christians use lot casting in the book of Acts. After the death of Judas Iscariot, the number of disciples had fallen from 12 to 11. In the first chapter of Acts, the disciples reckon that they need to get that number back to 12. They choose two people who meet their criteria, and then they cast lots, and the lot falls on Matthias, and he becomes the 12th disciple. In the story of Jonah, the lot falls correctly on Jonah. So we are left with the sense that God did, in fact, let his will be known through the casting of lots. It is interesting that everyone on board seems to be agreed on the fact that this storm is so bad that it must be an act of God. It's not just some normal run-of-the-mill bad storm. It's not just the luck of the draw. This is not the way that mainstream Jews and Christians today view storms and other natural disasters. When Superstorm Sandy struck our region in 2012, we weren't all pointing fingers at whose sin was to blame. And when TV preachers do try and pit the blame of a natural disaster on some group of sinners, like Hurricane Katrina's strike on New Orleans, they are roundly and rightly criticized. We should note here that when the sailors try and find the culprit, they aren't looking at other people. They aren't lifting up some scapegoat person or class of people and blaming them for their misfortune. No, they cast lots, assuming that any one of them could be the guilty party. It's almost an act of introspection more than an act of blame. And when they find the person to blame, they don't rush to gather the pitchforks and torches. They said to him, tell us you who have brought this misfortune upon us, what is your business? Where have you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? These are kind of odd questions in light of the mortal danger that everyone is in. They divined that Jonah was the source of their trouble, and the first thing that they want out of him is biographical data. Who are you? What do you do? Where are you from? These are questions that seem more fit for an interview than an interrogation, much less while waves are crashing against the boat and wind is roaring like a freight train. I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made both the sea and the land. The men were greatly terrified, and they asked him, What have you done? And when the men learned that he was fleeing from the service of the Lord, for so he told them, they said to him, What must we do to make the sea calm around us? For the sea was growing more and more stormy. Israelites don't usually refer to themselves as Hebrews. It's how other nations referred to them. It makes sense that Jonah, speaking to foreigners, would use this term. There are These are actually the first words that Jonah speaks in the book that bears his name. And he doesn't dwell on himself. He moves right to talking about his God. In this translation, Jonah says, I worship the Lord. But literally, he says, I fear the Lord. Usually fear in the Bible connotes awe and reverence. But 
This same Hebrew word was just used a few verses prior to reference the sailor's fear of the storm. But of course, how much does Jonah really fear the Lord if he's willing to directly contravene what he's asked him to do? The sailors ask Jonah for direction as to what they are to do, which is, I think, an amazing display of restraint. Here's the fellow who has put all of their lives in danger, and they are asking him what they are to do to make it right. He answered, heave me overboard, and the sea will calm down for you. For I know that this terrible storm came upon you on my account. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to regain the shore, but they could not, for the sea was growing more and more stormy about them. They tried heaving the cargo overboard, but it had no effect on the storm. Things just got worse. Now Jonah is telling them to heave one more piece of cargo overboard himself. Incredibly, the sailors don't seem to want to do this. They pick up their oars and try rowing for shore and safety first. I don't know, but if I think if I were in their shoes, I might have just done what the man said. They are in this life-threatening predicament because of Jonah. And if he said to throw him overboard, who would I be to argue with him? Notice, though, what Jonah says, or more accurately, what he doesn't say. I mean, what else could Jonah have said to the sailors to calm the storm? He could have said, turn the ship around, right? Take me to Nineveh. But Jonah was choosing death over obedience to God. This is how badly Jonah did not want to do what God had told him to do.